In the field of psychology, Machiavellianism is a personality trait centered on manipulativeness, callousness, and indifference to morality with high levels of self-interest. The term is derived from a 16th century Italian philosopher named Niccolo di Bernardo Machiavelli and his most famous work, The Prince. In the underworld of the American Mafia, there have been some mafiosos who embody this personality trait. To them, the ends always justify the means. They are Machiavellian mobsters, and these are their stories. Number 18. Tony. Joe Batters. Accardo. Antonio Leonardo Accardo was born on April 28, 1906 in Chicago's near west side. Young Accardo was the second of six children belonging to shoemaker Francesco Accardo and his wife Maria Tilata Accardo. One year before his birth, the Accardos had immigrated from Castelventrano in the province of Trapani, Sicily to America. Like many immigrants of the era, the family lived in abject poverty and by the age of 14, young Accardo had left school and begun loitering around neighborhood pool halls. He would dabble in petty crime and would soon join the Circus Cafe gang run by Claude Maddox and Tony Capizzo. The Circus Cafe gang was one of many street gangs that ran the poor neighborhoods of Chicago. These gangs served as a talent pool for the city's adult criminal organizations. Jack Machine Gun McGurn, who was one of the top hitmen in Chicago, recruited Accardo into his crew. McGurn's crew worked for the most powerful organized crime syndicate in the city, run by boss Al Capone. This syndicate would become known as The Outfit. Accardo made his mark in the Chicago outfit early on as one of their most brutal enforcers. He was alleged to have killed three members of the outfit believed to have been turncoats by beating them to death with a baseball bat. Admiring his handiwork, Chicago boss Al Capone is alleged to have said, That kid's a real Joe Batters, comparing the beating Accardo laid down to the hitting performance of star Major League Baseball player Joe DiMaggio. After this comment, Joe Batters became a nickname often associated with Accardo. In later years, Accardo boasted over federal wiretaps that he participated in the infamous 1929 St. Valentine's Day Massacre, in which allegedly Capone gunman murdered seven members of rival Bugs Moran's Northside gang. Accardo also claimed that he was one of the gunmen who murdered Brooklyn gang boss Frankie Yale, again by Capone's orders to settle a dispute. However, most experts believe that Accardo only had peripheral connections, if any, to the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, and none whatsoever with the Yale murder, which was most likely committed by Gus Winkler, Fred Burke, and Louis Campagna. However, on October 11, 1926, Accardo may have participated in the assassination of Northside gang leader Jaime Weiss near the Holy Name Cathedral in Chicago. Whether these admissions were true or not, Accardo developed a fierce reputation which followed him up the ranks of the Chicago outfit. In 1931, Capone was convicted of tax evasion and sentenced to 11 years in prison. Capone's nominal successor was Frank the Enforcer Nitty, with Paul Rica as the front boss. However, according to crime historian Carl Sifakis, Rica held the actual power in the outfit. Rica frequently overruled Nitty's orders, saying, We'll do it this way. Now let's hear no more of it. In addition, the leaders of the New York families, including Lucky Luciano, dealt only with Rica, not Nitty. Meanwhile, Accardo continued his rise within the outfit. Accardo had established a solid record of making money for the organization, so Nitty and Rica let him establish his own crew. He was also named as the outfit's head of enforcement. Accardo soon developed a variety of profitable rackets, including gambling, loan sharking, bookmaking, extortion, and the distribution of untaxed alcohol and cigarettes. As with all capo regimes, Accardo received a percentage of the crew's earnings as tribute. Accardo in turn paid tribute to the outfit's bosses. If a crew member refused to pay tribute or paid less than half of the amount owed, they would be killed. Accardo's crew included future outfit heavyweights 
Gus, Gussie Alex, and Joseph, Joey Doves, Ayupa. In the 1940s, Accardo continued to gain power in the outfit. As the decade progressed, senior members of the outfit were investigated and charged with using a threat of a strike by the labor unions they controlled to extort millions of dollars from Hollywood studios. On March 18, 1943, Paul Rica, Tony Accardo, and the rest of the outfit leadership met with Frank Nitti. Since the movie studio racket was Nitti's idea, Rica, Accardo, and the outfit leaders demanded that Nitti plead guilty to extortion to save the rest from prison. The fact that a boss would even be asked to take the fall for his subordinates shows Nitti's weakness and where the power really rested in the outfit. Feeling that there was no way out, Nitti, who was claustrophobic and fearful of serving a second term in prison, committed suicide in 1943. It was then that Paul the Waiter Rica, who had been the de facto boss since Capone's imprisonment, took the role officially. For his first act as boss, Rica would name Tony Accardo as his underboss. Accardo excelled in this role and the outfit would flourish because of it. On December 30, 1943, Rika and his associates were convicted of extortion and each sentenced to 10 years in federal prison. When Rika began serving his sentence for his part in the Hollywood scandal, Accardo became acting boss. Rika would over time take a less active role in the day-to-day -day administration of the rackets run by the outfit, leaving Accardo to handle those responsibilities. Three years later, when Rika was barred from contact with mobsters as a condition for his parole, Accardo officially became boss of the outfit. However, in practice, he shared power with Rika, who remained in the background as a senior consultant. Under Accardo's leadership in the late 1940s, the outfit moved into slot and vending machines, counterfeiting cigarette and liquor tax stamps during World War II, and also expanded narcotic smuggling throughout the country. Accardo placed slot machines in gas stations, restaurants, and bars throughout the outfit's territory. Outside of Chicago, the outfit expanded into Las Vegas and took influence over gaming away from the five families of New York City. Accardo ensured that all legal Las Vegas casinos used his slot machines. In Kansas and Oklahoma, he took advantage of the official ban on alcohol sales to introduce bootlegged alcohol. The outfit eventually dominated organized crime in most of the western United States. Accardo even attempted to phase out some of the traditional mob activities such as labor racketeering and extortion to reduce the outfit's exposure to legal prosecution. This was met with limited success and certain crews within the outfit would continue to operate in these areas. He would, however, convert the outfit's brothel business into a call girl service making their prostitution rackets tougher for law enforcement to prosecute. These changes resulted in a golden era of profitability and influence for the outfit. Over the years, Accardo began to develop a large criminal profile and was being investigated by several law enforcement entities. Like his old boss and partner, Paul Rica, Accardo decided to step back and relinquish his position as boss. After 1957, Accardo turned over the official position as boss to Rika protege Sam Momo Giancana because of heat from the IRS. Accardo then became the outfit's consigliere, stepping away from the day-to-day -day running of the organization. He still retained considerable power and demanded ultimate respect. Giancana still had to obtain the sanction of Accardo and Rika on all major business, including murders. By staying in the background, Rika and Accardo avoided further imprisonment far longer than Capone did. In 1957, the federal government charged Paul Rika with illegally entering the United States under the alias Paul Maglio. Three years earlier, the government had located the real Paul Maglio in Chicago and brought him to testify against Rika, whose citizenship was revoked. Although the government won a deportation order, it was later overturned. In 1959, Rika was convicted of tax evasion and sentenced to nine years in federal prison. After serving 27 months of his sentence, Rika was released. 
1965, Rika was again indicted for tax evasion. In court, Rika maintained that his total income for 1963 of $80,159 was earned at the racetrack. Rika was eventually acquitted. By the mid-1960s, the working relationship eventually broke down between Tony Accardo and Sam Giancana. Unlike Accardo, the widowed Giancana lived an ostentatious lifestyle, frequenting posh nightclubs and dating high-profile singer Phyllis McGuire. Giancana also refused to distribute some of the lavish profits from the outfit casinos in Iran and Central America to the rank-and-file members. Many in the outfit also felt that Giancana was attracting too much attention from the FBI, which was forever tailing his car around the Chicago metropolitan area. Around 1966, after Giancana began a year in jail on federal contempt of court charges, Accardo and Rica replaced him with Samuel Battaglia. Giancana was then essentially put on the shelf and exiled to Mexico. Then on October 11, 1972, Paul Rica would die of a heart attack at St. Luke's Hospital in Chicago. He would be buried at Queen of Heaven Cemetery in Hillside, Illinois. By this time, Accardo had installed Joseph Joey Doves Ayupa as the street boss, with Accardo continuing his role as consigliere and senior advisor. As always, no major moves or hits were ordered without Accardo's approval. With Rika now out of the picture, Sam Giancana's life fell into jeopardy. In June of 1975, after spending most of his outfit exile years in Mexico and being unceremoniously booted from that country, Giancana was murdered in the basement apartment of his home in Oak Park, Illinois, while cooking Italian sausages for dinner. Then, in January of 1978, Accardo and his wife Clarice went to their condo in Indian Wells to enjoy the sun, entrusting their house to longtime friend Michael Volpe. But their holiday would be short-lived. On January 9th, they received a call from Volpe, who told them someone had broken into their home. Nothing had been stolen, but the house had been ransacked. The burglary was a personal insult to Accardo, and it didn't take long for him to find out which burglars might have had an issue with him. Accardo wasted no time in gathering intel on those who may have been involved. The outfit's Las Vegas enforcer, Anthony Spilatro, was called back to Chicago to oversee this piece of business. On January 20th, police found the body of Bernie Ryan. His throat had been slashed from ear to ear and he had been shot four times. Ryan was a known burglar, and when police discovered his body, he had a police scanner on him, which is used by a lot of burglars to monitor police activity. Then, a known associate of Ryan's was found dead. Stephen Garcia's throat had also been slashed from ear to ear, but instead of being shot, Garcia had multiple stab wounds. The next to turn up dead were Vincent Moretti and Donald Swanson. Moretti had been badly tortured, presumably because he was Italian and was expected to know better than to break into the home of the boss. Moretti had been castrated and disemboweled, and his face had been burned off with an acetylene torch. He and Swanson also had their throats slashed. On February 20th, police discovered the body of John Mendel, the man who could defeat most burglar alarms and who was believed to be the mastermind behind the burglary. Mendel had also been tortured before his throat had been slashed. It seems as if the group of burglars who were responsible for the grave insult had all been dealt with, but Accardo wasn't finished. If there was a chance you were involved, Accardo wanted you dead. John McDonald was found on April 14th with his throat slashed. He was also shot in the head and neck. On April 26th, Bobby Hertogs was also found with his throat cut and his body riddled with bullet holes. Hertogs was the final member of the crew of burglars who could have been or were involved in the burglary of Accardo's home, but the bodies just kept dropping. In September of 1978, a federal grand jury held hearings regarding this situation. Accardo was called to testify, but he took the fifth and revealed nothing. Then Michael Volpe, the man responsible for watching the house, was called to testify. 
he spent a lot of time before the grand jury. Too much time. On October 5th, his family reported him missing, and he hasn't been seen since. The heat on Ocardo intensified after the federal grand jury, and only got worse when the FBI searched his house and found $275,000 in bundles. Some of the bundles were wrapped in bank wrappers from the Valley Bank in Las Vegas. Ocardo, feeling the heat, realized that he had to eliminate two more men who could tie him to the killings of the burglars. In 1979, two Chicago outfit mobsters were murdered. John Borsellino and Jerry Carusiello had taken care of the burglars, and now they themselves had been taken care of. This final act eliminated all ties from the murders to Ocardo. In the late 1970s, Ocardo bought a home in Palm Springs, California, flying to Chicago to preside over outfit sit-downs and mediate disputes. By this time, his personal holdings included legal investments in commercial office buildings, retail centers, lumber farms, paper factories, hotels, car dealerships, trucking companies, newspaper companies, restaurants, and travel agencies. He stayed away from direct involvement in illegal rackets towards the end of his life. He still, however, was seen as an elder statesman in the mob, and many suspect he still held sway until the day of his death. Ocardo spent his last years in Barrington Hills, Illinois, living with his daughter and son-in-law. On May 22, 1992, Anthony Accardo died of respiratory and heart conditions at the age of 86. Accardo is buried in a crypt in the mausoleum at Queens of Heaven Cemetery in Hillside, Illinois. Despite an arrest record dating back to 1922, Accardo spent very little time in jail. He was a man who always thought two steps ahead and was as ruthless as he was intelligent. When it came to Machiavellian traits, Tony Joe Batters Accardo had them in spades.